Hello, everyone. Um, we are here for Sickening to talk about queer horror comics. Um, I guess I guess we can just start. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks everyone for coming. We're really excited to, to discuss queer horror comics with you. Um, my name is William O. Tyler. I am a comic creator and a um, editor as well as a film critic. Um, and I, I, I've worked on uh, Theater of Terror, Revenge of the Queers anthology along with Justin Hall co-editing. Um, a few of our panelists were actually in that book as well. Um, in addition to that, I am half of Tannis Comics, which is a queer horror um, publishing company that I do along with Dave Davenport, who's on the end. Um, and that's a little who, of who I am. And I will let the, the panelists introduce themselves. I'm moderating, by the way. Um, Yes, um, and we do have slides of, of the work um, of our panelists, but I'll, I'll, let's just go down the line and let the panelists introduce themselves. Hello, uh, my name is Diego. Um, I, uh, let's see, I was part of the Theater of Terror anthology as well as some other anthologies. Uh, oh, that's one of my pieces right there that I did for a friend. Um, I have my horror comics called Hell Babes. It's kind of like uh, RuPaul's Drag Race in Hell, and I'm the queen of that drag hell. Here's some of the images from it. Um, yeah, I also teach in the fashion department at City College. Uh, if you're a resident, classes are really cheap. Come on down. Um, yeah. Hi, I'm Robin. Robin Adams, um, and I'm a huge fan of your work. Thanks. I just adore Me too it. with you. Um, and yeah, I'm here primarily because I was involved with the uh, Theater of Terror project as well. Um, I feel a little out of place sometimes because that was really this, only the second comic story that I had done in like 30 years. Um, I have some history doing comics in the 90s. I did a trans superhero comic called Home is on Five uh, that had about three issues. There it is. And uh, I was very much a um, sort of a 90s superhero take on queer activism. And, um, and currently I am uh, working on a, a comic book adaptation of the drag queen film Vegas in Space. Um, but I did a couple of, I, I, this is my story for Theater of Terror and I uh, had a great time doing it. It was a real honor to be in the book with all these amazing artists. Oh, hello. Hi, uh, my name is Malcolm Johnson. Uh, I am a comic book illustrator. Um, my stuff is uh, newly queer. <laughs> this is kind of uh, kind of finding my voice uh, in the medium and in the uh, the work recently. Um, but my some of my characters, uh, Bermuda Jones, in there. Um, this is uh, my third book, and it represents a non-binary character who fights demons and monsters uh, after the world, uh, the, after the apocalypse drops and happens. So they kind of go around and solve mysteries and sleuths and the pitch is it's um, Tintin meets Clive Barker's Nightbreed, um, if any of you are familiar with Nightbreed. Um, yeah, I also work on a comic called uh, Tales of Hoodoo Horror, which is an anthology of short stories based around hoodoo. Uh, African-American conjure root work, um, which is like a blend. It's kind of like the gumbo of magic. You have a bunch of combinations of different magical practices coming coming together. Um, so this is a page from the book uh, with the beautiful Josephine Baker. Um, and uh, yeah, they're all horror based. They're all spooky and scary. And uh, there's a lot of education too on the, um, the lore of hoodoo and hoodoo horror. So it kind of teach about like the background of you know where hoodoo came from and um, uh, just certain practices and magical rituals that uh, are uh, associated and based around that. So yeah, that's my work. I'm Dave Davenport, hello. Um, I've been doing queer erotic horror comics for 20 years about, I would say, and I've, I've, I've just, my character's feral and the ghost Skater, I've been doing about all the, that time. Um, I was in 
the Theater of Terror anthology with these guys. It was an honor to be in there. I illustrated one of William's uh, scripts, which was one of the best things I, I think we both worked on. Um, mostly I've done, like I said, erotic horror fiction, but um, I'm just debuting a zine here at this, this little Pride and Panels convention that's more a, um, analysis about why I love um, a Sadako, the um, Japanese horror character, and just what's queer about her and what I love about her queerness. And that's, it's my venture into non-erotic horror, I would say, but thank you. So I guess um, to get things started, um, I, have, I have notes, so don't mind me. I'm not like reading texts or anything like that. Um, I wanted to ask like, what about the horror genre interests all of you? Like what is it that brings you to horror as opposed to other genres, like telling queer stories in romance or something like that? What is it about horror that, that really calls to you? Um, so Justin, the co-editor of Theater of Terror asked me if I had a horror story, so I said yes. <laughs> so uh, I was working, well, I had like thought of this idea of like uh, dead celebrities in hell, and then I thought, oh, what if they were celebrity impersonators instead so they wouldn't necessarily be like a, um, a copyright issue? So I, and, um, so I like gave them all like uh, pun versions of their name. Like they're, instead of Eartha Kit, it's Gertha Kit. Um, and and stuff like that. So um, I'm into campy horror. Like uh, I'm wearing a, a Frankenhooker shirt. Has anyone seen that? Um, not many people. Wow. It's really um, yeah. It's there's problematic things in it, but um, it's I think it's pretty funny. Um, and yeah, I'm really kind of into like the Elvira side of horror as opposed to, like I'm not really into like slasher, hostile kind of things. Um, well, let's see, I, I was just raised on horror movies and monsters and all that stuff, of course. Um, I've never considered myself a horror fan per se, but um, I certainly find that um, Telling stories, like, it seems like I express a lot of my own fears through my stories. And, um, and so basically it's like sometimes that gets scary and sometimes that gets um, violent. And, um, and I think also like from a trans point of view, um, there's just so much opportunity for kind of a more mystical, magical, transformative kind of theme that I really enjoy. Um, so, yeah. I think for me, why, uh, I mean, kind of like what Robin said with uh, growing up in horror, uh, my uh, siblings would <laughs> lock me in a room and have me watch horror movies and just traumatize me, but in the best ways, right? Uh, educating me, let's just say that, educating me on the genre. Um, and I just, <laughs> maybe I'm just weird, but I like to scare people <laughs> in the consensual, you know, picking up a book and reading it way. Um, but yeah, I, there's a, there's a shorthand to the, the medium and the, the types of stories that we tell, uh, through horror. Uh, I think that connects us as a community. Um, like just like the tropes that I enjoy, you know, slasher from slasher to, to, Haunted House to, um, you know, uh, young adult horror stuff. Um, there are certain conventions that I just, uh, I think are playful and fun and scary at the same time that uh, I like, I kind of like playing with those tropes. Um, yeah. Like you guys, I grew up watching horror. It was a staple in my family growing up and, um, I just love monsters. I think they're fun. I love drawing them. I love um, world building and the mythology 
that comes with monsters and horror. Um, I love the dualities that's in some of them, like the Wolfman, obviously. Um, and yeah, I don't know. It's, it's just a, a fun medium to work with or a fun genre to work in. Well, I want to piggyback on something. A couple of you um, uh, talked a little bit about, like you said you, um, Malcolm, you said you <laughs> were traumatized watching movies as a kid. Um, and Robin, you said you kind of, it's kind of like a catharsis where you're working through your own feelings. Um, but horror can be very triggering and traumatic um, quite often. I mean, that's, that's kind of a part of the genre. So how do you navigate for yourself as a creator and also for your audience, how do you navigate content that could be triggering for people um, but still stay true to what you're trying to say or trying to do? I don't know, I just worry about it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, you know, it, well, so uh, again, you know, the story that I did in Theater of Terror was the first, I was given the assignment to do a horror story. And I got really behind on the deadline because I was sort of like, what the hell am I going to do? And I felt like a lot of, like some of the ideas that I came up with or that were occurring to me were, I was like, God, is that just like unintentionally transphobic? Or, you know, it's just like, where's that line of, of, of making it queer but not making it homophobic, you know? Um, what I ended up doing, I, I, I ended up doing a ghost story, which I feel is like a little bit of a cop out because there's no sex or gore in it. Um, but it's, it's fun and, and kind of glamorous. Um, and for me, it was, a, it was an expression of, of what the, 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 the ghost character dies without ever having to come out as trans and is basically throwing the supernatural fit because she's being dis misgendered. Um, throughout history, and so um, so that she's expressing herself and her true identity, and I cast myself as a ghost hunter who went and uh, spoke with her. So um, you know, for me, I, that was like, well, what's the scariest thing that I could think of right then and there? Which was like, I was two or three years into transition at that point. It was like, yeah, if somebody tried to take this away from me, or if I had to die, not being my authentic self, that would fucking suck. Excuse me. And so, um, so anyway, that's what motivated the, the, the story. And um, yeah. I, oh, I was just going to say, this is round robin, so anyone can, can answer any of yeah. these questions. No, I, um, I kind of think about what it's like to be black and queer with my art, um, especially with the um, Bermuda Jones. Um, even though they're a non-binary character, I kind of identified with a lot of their, uh, within the story, again, they're, they're surrounded by monsters and demons and the, the new world is taken over by them. So they're kind of isolated in that sense. And I think a lot of my, through a lot of my own personal queerness, I, I felt a little a lot isolated. So I was like, how do I remedy this? Like, you know, finding a community and finding friends and finding an attachment through horror in that community, there's a lot of crossover, you know, you have punk and goth and, and queer and you have all these intersections. So you have a, to answer your question maybe, to get it back to around the answer to the question. Um, yeah, I think for me, how do you handle it uh, to not be triggering? And I think for, through my work, I try to use humor. Um, I try to be a little bit more, there's levity in it, you know, there's scariness and there's violence, um, but there's kind of a tongue-in-cheekness to it, so it's not explicitly there to, like, scare you, it can, even though that's kind of the job of the, the work, um, yeah. Anyone else? Um, well, I'm queer, and I often think, what isn't queer horror? Just kind of like looking at your phone, things are fucking wild. Um, I like often also think just like how I'm a mess, but like somehow people are even messier, and I'm like, how the fuck did you do that? Um, yeah. <laughs> well. Okay, so let's talk about that. How do you, how, what is it like creating horror creatively 
when the world is the way it is right now? When there's so much horror in the, in the world, do you find it, do you find creating horror as content a, um, a, a way to escape the real world or is it drawing um, attention to things that need to be seen in the real world or? Well, I think like horror has always been kind of political. Like you trace it back to like the, the you know, uh, James Wales, right? Like with Frankenstein and his message about queerness and uh, you can even take that back even further to like Nosferatu or, you know, telling campfires by the story by the, story by the campfire and, um, uh, I'm sorry, what's the question again? <laughs> it, it, like, like creating horror versus the horror of the real world. Right. How do you, how do you coincide Right, so that? it's like, so, so politically we've always kind of had horror as a way to like express or, or cathartically move through troubling times. You know, it's uh, ex exercise in, yeah, catharsis and uh, having to explore and get into hard topics that are tough to talk about and how do you transcribe them without you know, kind of like the, the previous question, how do you do this without offending or being, being kind and gentle to your audience? Um, and I think that just, for me personally, I, I'm, and <laughs> again, I'm trying to like explore a lot of my queerness is by reaching out and getting other people's opinions and getting feedback and, oh, is this offensive? Does this work? Does this not work? You know, it's kind of like a, uh, you, you, you have to workshop your ideas a lot for, um, for horror, I think. Um, but like, I, I personally think it's important to have uh, some sort of voice in horror, um, especially for nowadays. I mean, look at this audience. This is a, everybody here is for horror. So it's like a huge, you know, you have a lot of people who are into this genre. Um, so we have all different points of views, all different backgrounds. Um, but yeah, I, I think horror is just, it's, it should be political. It should be angry and scary and because and, yeah we do face these things in the real world and you know um, escape it's it, it can also be used again like horror is uh, multifaceted it's not just about scaring people there's there's comedy there's romance and horror you know there's adventure there's so many other genres or sub types of horror that you can explore um, that necessary don't necessarily have to be political but I think it somehow creeps its way out no matter what, it's, it's, it's always got to kind of be under the surface, you know? I think the, you know, a lot of the energy um, behind queer expression that I've experienced in my life is about like scaring the hell out of people, you know? Like drag queens used to scare people and weren't on TV, they scared people, <laughs> you know? And they enjoyed that, you know? Um, putting yourself, out there um, as, you know, being an outsider, putting it in their face, um, freaking people out, you know. Peach's Christ, of course, right now is like this huge, has made a, an industry out of queer horror. Um, that, the lineage of that is coming from the, the, the Tea Shack nightclub in the mid 90s, which was kind of a horror show, you know. It was not glamorous drag, it was fright drag. And, um, and it was very, it was very powerful, and it was a real, real powerful expression of, um, you know, what was going on in San Francisco in the '90s, which was kind of intense and horrifying. Um, it was a way to have fun and scream at the same time. Um, one of the um, creators of of T Shack was the drag queen Heklina, who passed recently, um, and they had this term for their drag, which was like art damage. Um, and I think they maybe, I think they used the word damage a lot, like maybe like uh, Catholic damage and stuff like that. So they did all these like really fun, artistic, like sometimes like kind of recreating music videos, but like on a dime budget. Um, so I went to the kind of like tail end of the years of T-Shack and it was really inspiring. And that's when I started doing drag and then um, my version of drag tends to be really campy, so my like kind of these zombies are like all snatched and just looking like, besides maybe being decapitated, they still look fantastic. Um, and my like second issue that I'm working on now of Hell Babes is um, the zombies are supposed to come to Earth and kind of fix everyone's problems in a kind of a campy way. I feel like. Um, 
specifically billionaires maybe needed to be like punched in the face uh and who who's all who's gonna do it other than like a zombie right because no one's really punching them in their face right now so we need some help i mean if they're zombies i hope they're also eating the rich totally Um, I, I was going to bring up how horror is seen as, as kind of lowbrow to some people, um, and, but how that also is a way to um, have horror represent a kind of, a kind of counterculture and, and revolutionary work. Um, and I was going to ask you all about that, but I think you all already just answered that. <laughs> so I, I also want to ask, because you, you talked about being a drag queen, um, Many of you on the panel do work outside of horror and outside of, of um, creating horror comics. Um, and I wanted to ask how creatively, when you're working in genres other than horror, do you have to have a different mindset to, to, to work in that content as opposed to horror, or is it very similar still? I just do horror, sorry, I can't. <laughs> That's kind of my bag, I kind of limited in that way. But not limited, but like, I just my narrow focus has just always been on like, just macabre stuff and everything. But I guess for Bermuda Jones, they, uh, what do you call it? It's like a, I'm trying to uh, morph it more into like a uh, young adult uh, book. So it's gonna be more for like, you know, it's not gonna be, explicitly gory or out there like who do horror, it's gonna be a little bit more um, just uh, teen friendly. Um, so with that, I just kind of scale back on like the, you know, uh, the, the violence, I guess, and just the X-rated uh, features of, uh, of telling a story while still keeping it like scary and spooky and kind of weird, so. What about Robin for you working on um, Venus? Is that a different process than, than creating horror work? Because it's more of a, a campy sci-fi. Vegas. Uh, Vegas, yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. Right. Um, well, sure, that's, a, that's kind of a, um, that's really just about how do I make it beautiful um, and glamorous and true to the source. Um, and so, I mean, in that way, any project is the same, you know, I mean, I. That's what I try to do anytime I do something is just try to make it beautiful. Um, but again, it's like I'm a little bit conservative. I don't like go out. I'm not trying to scare people, right? I would not have functioned well at, at T Shack. <laughs> you know, it's not my style. So um, I'm just a little less. And, and in, in a way, I'm also very literal, you know. Um, like Homozone 5 was a very sort of literal like reaction to political things that were happening in the world. Um, I feel like I'm getting off track, but. No, not at all. We want to hear this, <laughs> whatever you want to say. I mean, I, I love hearing about um, how politics and, and real world things come into well, our work, so. I mean, you know, like, I don't know. I really wanted to save the world. I was so worried about it, you know? And here we are 35 years later and it's like, oh, great, worse, thanks. Um, so, uh, I don't know how art can save the world, you know, I'm not sure I necessarily care about that, but I do think that it's like very important on a, on a, you know, that idea of like, you can touch people on a personal level, right? And like queer comics, you know, throughout the history of queer comics, you know, I mean, you've got visibility, you've got, you know, putting a name to something that people don't even know how to talk about, you know, and telling those stories and, and and making people feel, you know, whatever. Um, so I don't know if we can save the world with comics, but uh, I, there was a question about that in the previous panel. And um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not as familiar with what's going on in queer comics right now as far as like, is there a lot of political stuff going on? You know, I mean, it's, it seems like the world is on fire right now. And um, I, would like to use my talent to do something about it, if possible. Uh, Dave, you've been making comics for, as you said, 20 years. What's, uh, have you noticed a difference in making horror comics back then compared to now? Is there, are there more people doing horror comics now? Um, there's more people doing queer horror comics, for sure. There's more people doing queer comics. It's, 
it's mushroomed. There's so many people doing it now. It's, it's, it's great. Keep it up. Did you say mushrooms? Yes. It's mushroomed. Oh, got it. Yes. <laughs> But you're, so your comic, Feral and the Ghost Skater, has been, your characters have been around for a while and you said you like world building. Um, so what is, what is, uh, for tr uh, transparency, Dave is my partner, so I know his answers to questions already. But I would love for, <laughs> I would love for him to talk about um, your Feral and the Ghost Skater comics and how they've evolved over the years with your world building and where you are now with those characters. That wasn't on the list of questions. Come on. No, we, I think we've kind of covered the list of questions that I came up with. Um, how has it evolved? Um, well, I, it started out as just like a lark. I did an illustration of a, a werewolf that had dug up a coffin in a graveyard and was in the process of eating and fucking the corpse at the same time. and. It, it was just an illustration. I had I was a tattoo artist at the time too. I had kind of drawn it up as a back piece too. I didn't. Nobody ever got it, and it's still available if anybody wants it. Um, but uh, good friends, Jackie, who were who were staying with, saw it and started asking me questions, and and um, that got me thinking. Well, how did this get to this point? And that's how the first story came about, which did tell how that scene came about. And then I just moved on from there. And it evolved mostly from just doing short stories that were self-contained, that, that were coming out in issues of Hard to Swallow that we were putting out, I was putting out with Justin Hall. Um, to after that, I started doing more of a long form story with the characters that I'm really wishing I had stuck with the short one and done's because I'm in the middle of a, a graphic novel that's taken 10 years so far, chipping away at it, and hopefully I'll get it done soon because I want to move on to other stuff. But um, that's mostly how it's evolved. Um, but I do try to... With this this longer form story, I am trying to do something deeper. My, my stuff is usually just kind of fun, I think. Fun, sexy, scary romps. But I'm trying to talk a bit about um, just like what we lost in the AIDS crisis a little bit and how, I don't know, trying to turn that into something positive. But I'm still working out the fine details of that, so... Um, do you have any questions for me? <laughs> Ask me? Do you have a question for me? Stop flashing your work, Tony. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't actually go through my work because I, my, I, my work was at the end of the slide and I'd already introduced myself. But um, this, is, I, this is a comic, Anxious Acts, that I'm currently working on. Um, that's all about a, a character who has very strong anxiety um, to the point where a monster manifests out of his shoulder and follows him, hangs, hanging off of his shoulder all the time and just whispers negative things in his ear and it's just, you know, anxiety building um, in a way that you can't control. Um, and it comes from a very real place where I feel that way. Like I'm usually very calm and collected on the outside, but I, my mind is almost always flowing with anxieties. Um, so it's kind of a, um, like some of you were saying earlier, it's kind of a cathartic way for me to deal with those things um, and those ideas that I have. Um, and then this other slide is actually, these are two stories that Dave and I have collaborated on. One was the first one in color is called The Vulture and was for Theater of Terror. And I wrote it and Dave illustrated it. Um, and it's basically about a black guy who dates a white guy who ends up appropriating his culture. So he's a culture vulture. Um, and then the, the black and white story is actually in Dave Sadako zine that he was talking about. We pitted um, two of our favorite girls, Sadako and Carrie, against each other um, to see what would happen if they were in some sort of telekinetic psych psychosis um, type of fight. 
Um, so that was a lot of fun to do. That collaboration was Dave drawing everything that had to do with Sadako and me drawing everything that had to do with Carrie. So it was the first time that we've seen our, our art styles on the page together. Um, so that was fun. That works. Um, I guess I'd like to open up questions to the audience. If there's anyone in the audience that'd like to, to ask something, you are here. Not exactly, oh, thank you so much. Um, how, how have you like, pro not exactly promoted your art, but how have you kind of talked about your art to people who might not have experience in either or both of those categories? I'm usually just very upfront about it and if they're interested, they'll listen and if they're not, they'll just walk away and that's that. <laughs> I would say it is, it is a hard thing to navigate sometimes when you want your work to get out there more and it seems like the general public is not interested. Um, but that's why we have things like this convention and this fest and, and Prism Comics and other resources that we can have our own community and share these things. So I'm, I'm very appreciative of, of things like this. I have a comic that isn't necessarily horror. It's about a horrible relationship that I had. Um, it's called Piss in the City, and it's about piss. Um, and it does not sell well, but people will read it at my table real fast or like at a bookstore that I sell at and laugh and say they love it. But no one's really buying it. Yeah. Yeah. It was in an anthology that. Yeah. Yeah. What's What's funny is that story did come out of an anthology that um, we did together called "Yellow Is the Warmest Color," which um, <laughs> it's available digitally. But we actually tried to print it, and and it just it, we couldn't work out the logistics of actually printing a book like that. Um, it's and very even niche. even even trying to raise money for that book um, was hard. We, we tried to do a, a, a crowdfunding thing and lots of people were interested, but not a lot of people wanted to be, I guess, associated with it on paper maybe, I don't know. Um, so yeah, that, that kind of thing is always hard. Any other questions? Um, I wanted to ask, um, uh, since everybody's a fan of horror here, uh, do, you, do you still see the value in having um, uh, queer villains? You know, the creature or monster that doesn't conform to society, either showcasing that in your work, or do you gravitate that as a fan, a horror fan, looking for that content? But I know William's gonna agree with this, that, that queer villains are always gonna be needed and they're kind of our heroes, so. It's like, yeah. It's, <laughs> Talented Mr. Ripley was my first kind of hero. <laughs> uh, I don't know if anyone's seen it. It came out in 1999. He was supposed to be a hero. Uh, but there wasn't a lot of movies with um, gay people in them. Um, so it's Matt Damon as a gay murderer in the, like, Italy 1950s. So everyone looked really fantastic, like what they were wearing. The cinematography. What? He was, you know, he was pining after Jude Law, so we all can understand. Yeah, exactly. Relatable. Uh, so he's kind of my, I don't know, my gateway or hero, who knows? Uh, I think for me it was, uh, talking about gateway horror was, um, again, back to when I was uh, raised on horror. Uh, Friday, not Friday, I'm sorry, um, Nightmare on Elm Street 3 and 2 were my uh, introduction into Freddy's world. So having his extreme campiness and just like hilarity and just like, he's just proud to be himself in all, in all its wretchedness and all its depravity and everything. And there's something to be said, I think about not our, you know, we, we can be ourselves now, you know, we can just express ourselves and, you know, be ourselves through our, through our work and, and representing horror villains that represent us. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, as long as 
we got the right people in the rooms telling the stories, that is. Um, you know, Buffalo Bill and Silence of the Lambs has done a lot of damage to a lot of people. Um, that was an irresponsible representation of queer and transness. And um, so, yeah, I'm a little bit. I mean, at the same time, like, I love, right? I love a big, fabulous villain, you know? I mean, Tim Curry and Rocky Horror, you know, bring me that kind of fabulous, sexy, messy energy. I love it. But, um, you know, the flip side of it is like, has, is kind of gross. Yeah. I, first, I want to say Nightmare on Elm Street 2 is one of the queerest horror movies ever. Exactly. So I, I absolutely love it. Um, but I, I always find heroes to be rather boring because heroes have to work within the rules of the society to get things done. Like my, my growing up, my favorite character was Catwoman because she wrote that line and she would do what she needed to do based on what needed to be done as opposed to what needed to be done legally. Um, and now I would say my favorite comic character is Poison Ivy because she takes it a step further and she's just like, nope, I'm done with all of you humans. <laughs> the earth needs to rebuild. Um, and that's where I am now. But I, I, I have always been a fan of villains and I kind of detest when we want to make villains redeemable now. Like Angelina Jolie as Maleficent is amazing. She's flawless, but the the redemption of that character is like, no, we just need we just need a character who's a bad girl. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, there was another question down here. I know you were saying a little bit about that. Where would you say like the line draws? What was the question again? I'm sorry. How do you depict horror in your comics while still keeping it for younger audiences? While keep, still, still, still keeping it queer for my audience or? For your younger for audience. audience. Sorry. Um, how do I keep it for younger audience? I mean, again, it's just, I think, so who do horror compared to Jones. Jones definitely, the style is a lot more friendlier. It's a lot more, there's a lot more levity in it. Uh, hoodoo horror is just people getting torn apart. <laughs> there's a lot of like body horror in there. Um, I don't think, that, did they answer your question? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Are there any more questions? Um, my question was, um, hold on, let me find it again. Um, what piece of horror media, either a movie or book, has inspired you the most? And this is to everyone. It could also just be your favorite. Nightbreed, help, uh, Clyde Barker, uh, director's cut for that. That's just, I just, I just love the monsters and the idea of somebody finding, finding that community um, in the, the creatures and the, the weirdness and that, that vibe. Um, again, relating it to, to queer horror, finding your community and finding your, your tribe and your, your, your pack in a way. Um, who else am I a fan of? Yeah. Uh, I'm also just, as far as, far as comic books are related, um, I'm a huge Hellblazer fan. Uh, John Constantine is like my hero in maybe the, not too many good ways, but <laughs> since he is a bit of a scoundrel. Um, but uh, yeah, having, having found a bisexual, pansexual character um, in comics was really like inspiring for me and just kind of opened my eyes to different uh, range of characters. Dave, you could talk about Sadako. I could, yeah. Um, I would say the, the First group of Sadako books um, by Koji Suzuki. Um, I just love everything that's done on those books. And I've put an unfortunate amount of those details into my other stories, um, using it for influence and inspiration um, with larger ideas that happen in the books. Um, and I would have to go back to say, like, the Hulk from the 70s, that sort of dynamic between Banner and the Hulk is, is 
really influences the way my main we uh, werewolf character was developed too, um, because he doesn't. He's the only werewolf in my book who doesn't like being a werewolf, and um, it's very much you know like don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. Only it's horny instead of angry. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, the Hulk hasn't exactly been like that for a long time, so I maybe would even just say like the, the TV show from the 70s, but I could go on, but please. Um, I was, oh God, it just went out of my head. Um, Well, so first off, I was just going to say that my biggest influences comic-wise were the Bill Sienkiewicz work in the 80s, um, that sort of, which isn't necessarily all horror, but I just really love that, the energy that he put into it and the way that those characters were developed with Chris Claremont. So that was really, really important to me. Electra Assassin was a real big influence on my work, on what I did. Um, and... Jeez, I can't remember what I was going to tell you. It was a great one, though. <laughs> was that this new class, right, with the um, uh, Chris Claremont, um, Bill Sienkiewicz, right? Or New Mutants. New Mutants, new 19, Mutants. 1984. Thank you, yeah. Showing my age. Yeah, I love this, too. Um, the, I'm more focused on, like, the aesthetics of horror um, and also, like, what's, like, kind of draggy. Um, I love, I forget which one it was in Nightmare on Elm Street when they're talking about his faggy Christmas sweater. Um, and I always wanted to do Gaga's manicure as uh, Freddy Cougar, but instead I did it to a Taylor Swift song about what she's like talking about uh, being a nightmare dressed like a daydream, like impale someone on stage. Um, and of course the Hollywood monsters, I've done a lot of uh, Bride of Frankenstein drag. Um, anything with like visible stitches I super love. So like Michelle Pfeiffer is Catwoman. Yeah. The idea that she made that outfit overnight, like I don't <laughs> think so. Um, they like in part had to sew her into it. Um, it's just uh, ridiculous and I love that. I was just the, Anne Rice's vampires, huge, huge, yeah. That was a huge one for me too. I mean, I, that, I, first started reading Interview with a Vampire when I was coming out, and their relationship was was hidden. It was like, wow. <laughs> um, as far as um, movies, because I'm a big movie fan, um, I, I probably Carrie. I mean, I mentioned her already in, in the comic that we put together, but that movie symbolizes something for me that's so important, where this character who is marginalized at school as well as at home, so she's really like in the margins, um, ends up having power and ends up having um, this realization about herself um, and not taking shit from anyone in the end. Um, that kind of is like uh, a personal inspiration for myself. Um, so yeah. So actually, I think we're at time. Um, apologies to folks that had another question, but thank you to our panel. And um, if you guys are interested, we'll have panel three in here, Out in the World Publishing Queer Comics, coming up in 10 minutes. Cool. Thank, thank you. you.